it makes you question humanity and, uh, and, and where it's gone at times. You see the best of both worlds in a job. You see the worst and you, and then sometimes you see, you see the best. You, know, you see babies being born. You see, uh, you know, uh, husband and wife welcoming their baby into this world. And this is a whole new chapter for them. Uh, you know, you definitely see good in people. Um, but you also see the worst. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from TheKnifeJunkie.com. Welcome to the show. We've got a great one for you, another interview coming up. And Bob, uh, some really cool uh, stories we're getting ready to hear from uh, your friend and yeah. uh, fellow knife enthusiast. Yeah, we're going to be talking to my old friend, Kurt, and he's a, uh, a firefighter and paramedic. And uh, we're going to get a little bit of trauma advice from him, some some stories from the field, some cautionary tales, if you will. And just some general knowledge download from him on the on the physical side of knife ownership, and some uh, some good advice he brought out in the interview uh, that I really don't think a lot of folks think about all the time. And I'll I'll just leave it at that and kind of tease it because some real good advice coming up in that interview. But before we get to that interview, I do want to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, your Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Bob, what do you say we get right into that interview? Well, let's do it, Jim. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Our guest today is Kurt Zapata. Kurt is a professional firefighter paramedic in Arlington, Virginia, right outside Washington, D.C. He's also an old friend, so if you sense a rapport, it goes way back. As a first responder, Kurt has seen many, many people on their very worst days, and he has told me some stories over the years both heartbreaking and repulsive. Kurt's long been aware of my love of knives. He's contributed numerous knives to my collection on various birthdays and such. But what he has seen, the trauma he's confronted on the job, the stories of the people he's helped, have always sobered me up when I've gone too far into my inner ninja. I admire the strength he has in facing the grisly aspects of his job, and to me, he represents an important mooring to reality. And I'm pleased to have him on the podcast. Kurt, welcome. Good to have you here, man. Thank you very much. Absolutely my my honor to be here. Well, you know, every uh, every show we 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 try to break the ice with a with a pocket check. So yeah. So let's let's talk about what we're carrying before we go deep down this hole. What, yeah. what do you have in your pocket today? Uh, right now I have a Kershaw knockout. Um, one of the many knives that you've given me. Actually, if you probably quiz me on this question for a week straight, it would probably be five different knives of which you've given me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the knockout's one of your favorites. Oh, I know that. That's a great knife. Absolutely, it is. Absolutely, I do enjoy this knife. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because I don't find myself using knives that much on the job. As a matter of fact, um, probably more often than not, you won't even find me with a knife uh, on the job. Um, and I have different reasons for that. Most guys are always have knives on the job. Um, and I used to be that way. Uh, I don't know if it's laziness, forgetfulness, or, uh, there are some other inherent agents that come with carrying a knife. Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll, we no doubt we'll get to that when you start telling us some of your stories. Yeah. Uh, so today I'm carrying, uh, this, my awesome XM 24 <laughs> Bowie knife, but, uh, you'll notice the scale is a custom scale. Yeah. Uh, this is from RC blade works. And I just ordered another one for another hinderer. Right. And so I think there's going to be an upcoming video in the next couple of weeks talking about another great small American business that's making uh, knife components for the aftermarket. And uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, the other thing I'm carrying in my pocket is this little friendly purple Spyderco Delica. And uh, we'll come back to the Delica. But before we do, I want to find out from you, Kurt, a little bit of context. Tell us about your training. <clears throat> your certifications. What does a paramedic do? Oh, well, uh, you know, they do a whole bunch of stuff uh, right now with the fire department. Uh, mainly they take care of advanced life support. Uh, so everybody in the fire, well, at least in our fire department and probably region wide, you have to be at a minimum an EMT basic. Uh, and that's basic first aid. Uh, that's, uh, I think it's not mistaken, about a year long course uh, at any community college or whatever you find. And they'll teach you basic life support, CPR, 
uh, general wound care, splinting broken bones, stuff like that. Paramedic is when you get into the more advanced, uh, the pushing of medications, narcotics, um, securing other people's airways via endotracheal tube or other means, um, putting IVs in, just a little bit more advanced uh, advanced practice. So is everyone on your department a paramedic as well as EMT or is EMT the baseline and some people excel? EMT is the baseline. And if you want to be a paramedic, uh, people go on for additional training. Um, you talked about certifications, I guess, to put it in context, uh, I was a paramedic or I still am a paramedic, uh, with the County Fire Department, uh, I've been with them for 14 years now. Um, I'm currently a Lieutenant at the Fire Training Academy. I've been part of the tech rescue team. I've been part of the hazmat team. So I've uh, kind of branched out in a couple of different areas as far as my profession goes. And that's the great thing about firefighting. If you have an interest in something that just firefighting, uh, there's always that those avenues to go down to get your enhanced training. So, so that tech rescue, that's, uh, is that like shoring up, uh, collapsing buildings and it deals with, uh, confined space, high angle rescue, uh, trench. Um, absolutely. Um, shoring, structural stabilization, uh, anything like that. Uh, our team was, uh, very, I was not a part of the department, but Arlington County's tech rescue team was, uh, obviously first on scene at the Pentagon, uh, 9-11. Uh, some of the pictures that they have of shoring up parts of the Pentagon with crib towers. And we're talking six by six pieces cut into, I would say probably, four and five foot spans stacked on top of each other, each one of those contact points. Uh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's 9,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds. So, wow. Uh, they're able to hold up immense amounts of weight. So, uh, yeah, that's to, yes, to make a <laughs> question a little longer than needed, I guess. Well, let me ask you this. Can this, Little purple, friendly looking spider codelica with this less than three inches of cutting. What, what kind of damage can this do to a human body? Is this a dangerous weapon? Okay. Well, so you know, a reference here's a little reference, uh, for you movie buffs out there. If I'm not mistaken, in the movie Hannibal, uh, part of the Silence of the Lambs film, uh, I guess trilogy with Red Dragon in there, uh, Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter, uh, cut the guy who was trying to get his fingerprints, prints. With a knife very similar to that. If it might have been the same exact knife, I don't, I don't know. Um, and he was able to kill him with one, one slash. Absolutely. That knife could kill you in, you know, as long as it takes you to bleed out. Okay. Okay. But it's, uh, it's not black and the blade isn't blackened and it's a short blade and it's purple. I mean, <laughs> I think you know as well as I know the, okay. the color okay. and the, uh, uh, size of the knife. Uh, doesn't really matter. Okay. Well, actually, you know, I'm joking about the purple part, but the, the blade does seem short. Can, if, if someone were to thrust this into my chest, could they reach vital organs with a blade this short? Uh, uh yeah, I think you could actually, if you were to go right into, uh, in, into the chest where the heart sits, uh, you could definitely puncture deep enough to get into the chest. Obviously it would depend on the person that you're, uh, if you were attacking them on, on where it hits and you have to make it between the, uh, the ribs. And it depends uh, on the strength and motivation of the, exactly, of the attacker. Exactly. Kind of so it is a, a bit of an equalizer, even if it is small and purple. Tell me from your perspective as a paramedic, as someone who um, prepares themselves or is prepared at any time of day or night to show up on scene and see the worst thing you've ever seen. What's that like both physically <clears throat> and emotionally when you respond to that kind of trauma call and do those experiences linger with you or can you wash them away because it's just work how does that work for you uh it's, yes they 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 absolutely linger all the time how do you deal with that when you first get out to the job obviously it, it probably those are the most impactful years because your body hasn't had it or your mind hasn't had a chance to adapt physically uh to seeing that type of stuff and it's all an adrenaline rush and it still is an adrenaline rush because no matter the carnage around you you have to remain the calmest person in the room and i think everybody struggles struggles with that at, at times because uh there are certain things that you'll see or smells or uh, sounds that that you see that are just uh, overwhelming overwhelming so you have to figure out a way to I guess compartmentalize them and put them in, in, in order. You're never really ready, 
you kind of just roll with the punches, I guess. Um, I'd say over the 14 years, I, I, I have many, many calls that, that stick with me to reference a, a movie, Detroit. There was a, a documentary done about Detroit Fire Department a few years ago. And one of the guys in there said, and it's kind of a corny line, but it is very true. Uh, if only my mind could forget what my eyes have seen. So, yeah, that's, um, you know, I, I get emotional talking about it just because it, it is a very true statement. And washing it away, I don't know. You, you have to seek therapy. Uh, right now, there's a huge push in the public safety sector for mental health wellness because while we may not get the concentrated amount of trauma, both physically and mentally, as soldiers do, uh, ours is over a longer period of time. Uh, you know, you're, you're spending some, sometimes 30, 35 years on a job. And that's, that's just so much exposure o- over those years. Uh, uh, so I think PTSD is being more recognized. There's more resources available. And I think with the newer generation of firefighters, they are more willing to accept the signs and symptoms. And it's, it, we're really trying to steer it away from that bravado of if you can't deal with it, you're not part of that job. The human body is not meant to to deal with that type of stuff. You know, you have to, something has to happen to it. Yeah. I think for the uninitiated, such as myself, I've never been in the military and I've never been a first responder. And I think, uh, you know, there's a, there's good and bad to seeing guys like you as heroes. I mean, which most of us do, but part of that is making you a hero also puts you up on a pedestal. Well, Kurt's tough. He can handle this stuff. Yeah. He's a tough (laughs) guy. You know, if you could see Kurt, you'd see he's a, he's a substantial man. And yet, I would imagine that seeing the things you have seen and helping the people you have helped have informed how you should live your life a little more cautiously or a little more thoughtfully, mindfully, so that the stupid mistake doesn't cost you everything. As you know, as my old friend, I have made a lot of stupid mistakes with knives, <laughs> just messing around, playing this and that, showing off. I told a story a couple of weeks ago to Dr. Frunky about how I stabbed myself in the leg with a sword cane trying to impress a girl. That was not very cool, but I could have just as easily have nicked my femoral artery, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Depending, and, and trust me, I know how sharp your knives are. So just the slightest graze with it, with one of your knives well, thank you. could, uh, <laughs> could, uh, could slice an artery very easily. So here's the thing. I, I, uh, you know, as a practitioner of martial arts and as a guy who's always handling knives, I've become very, um, casual with them. And I'm, I, I remind, try to remind myself over and over that, uh, you know, I don't want to spend time in the hospital. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to make that call to my wife, honey, <laughs> yeah. I was doing something stupid. And now I think you have to come home and take me to the hospital. Yeah. Like, I don't want to need a new carpet. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So with all the stupid things I've, I've done, it, what you're saying, it would be easily, it, it would be easily done for me to nick myself and bleed. How, how long would it take for me to say I did hit an artery or something like that? All how right. serious is that? Like, uh, in yourself. the movies, it sprays. It, it, it can, it absolutely can. It can spray. It can spurt with the, you know, with the pumping of your heart. Um, so you will bleed out faster than you will. You will, you will die by bleeding out faster than you would if you were to stop breathing. You have about f- between four to six minutes before brain death occurs without oxygen. But, uh, with uh, hitting a, hitting a major artery, you have about three minutes to stop that before you, before you, you lose enough blood to die. So. I, as a knife enthusiast and somebody who is as comfortable with knives as you are and, and making of knives as well, um, having a little blowout kit for yourself handy, uh, with a tourniquet, uh, a couple pressure bandages, a couple H bandages, mm-hmm. uh, whatever style you, you, you prefer and know how to apply those one handed. And you'll see those things like that are, I mean, those are kind of right now being pushed to the forefront, uh, with public safety, uh, with both police and fire. All police in Arlington County, I know at least they carry tourniquets and H bandages because uh, a lot of times they're first on scene to something like that. And you could save somebody's life. So before before the paramedics even get there. The absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing how to fashion a tourniquet um, and really knowing the intricacies of it, because in the movies they show you, you know, a guy uh, ripping off his belt, and uh, which which can very much be used. Uh, and then, and then, you know breaking something or figuring out something for a windlass and then twisting it. And it, it is that easy, but you have to know how hard to do it. Uh, uh, I was lucky enough to be part of a study when we were testing out tourniquets where our medical director 
had uh, he had an ultrasound uh, on my on my foot on top of my artery, and he was checking to see how hard the tourniquet had to be applied. And for myself, being a former bike courier and riding the bike and weightlifter, I have larger thighs than normal, I guess. Uh, so they put it on, and let me tell you the pain that that inflicts. Getting a tourniquet put on you to hard enough to stop the blood flow is uh you really have to crank down on it seems like it might be even worse than the initial wound that you're trying oh to yeah get. yeah absolutely i mean it's pain it really is pain well on a on a on a giant muscular leg uh, uh that artery is buried underneath muscles right so you got to compress that yeah. down really really oof. and you also have to get the placement correct so where you're not fighting against all that muscle you have to get high enough up into let's say you were to nick an artery on your leg somewhere you mean you dropped it and all of a sudden you yeah somehow nick an artery on your leg okay you have to place it all the way up into the groin right below the hip to really kind of affect that area so because that's where it comes closest to the, the exactly skin or the, exactly. the surface so um so you said a tourniquet h bandages so you said learn to apply this with one hand why is that is that because the other hand is is jammed in the wound stopping it from bleeding or what could be could be absolutely. You cut yourself deep enough, and uh, you're able to get your finger in there and and, and tamp down that wound. Um, that's what's gonna that'll stop the initial blood loss. Mm -hmm. You know that's uh, that's one of the things that that we're taught. You stick your fingers into the wound, and you you put the pressure directly onto the cut part of the artery while you're getting your your gauze, uh, getting your pressure dressing or your tourniquet. So eh, you know, and and you can you can buy. As I know, I mean, you, you, you've you been on uh, the different, you've turned me on to different sites uh, like for, for survival gear, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You can buy them where they have the um, quick clot, stuff like that, quick clot bandages. You know, those are those are great. Or the, the powder, you know, anything like that, just in case. It's always better to have the just in case, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to show up on a site, if you're if you're to hear a call, you're OK, you're sleeping. This is, this is when you're on tour, yeah. you're sleeping. It's the dead of the night. A call comes through. You're up. You're throwing your gear on. What would you rather hear? Gunshot wound or knife wound? Too general. Uh, it, it, that, that, yeah, that's absolutely, uh, it's too general because it could, it depends on the knife, depends on the gun. It depends on the attack. It depends well. on the attack. Yes. I mean, I've, I've seen some, uh, horrible, horrible, uh, attacks with knives that, uh, make you question humanity. Um, I'm, so, I'm going to go there. Like what? <laughs> tell, tell me a couple of stories. Uh, uh, you know, the first one that I was ever on was, um, uh, it was right behind a, a hospital, um, literally a, less than a block away from the hospital. Uh, and a man had uh, stabbed uh, a woman. Um, I, I guess they were involved. Uh, so it was a domestic and he killed her and we pulled up on scene and he was still on scene. Little, much to my chagrin, you know, one of the things you, you train for is always scene size up. Okay. You get there and you size up the scene really quick to make sure, Hey, everything's safe. I'm not going to get killed going out to try and help whoever it is in need or whatever the situation is. Well, I saw a guy standing there and to me, he just looked like a bystander. Like maybe, maybe the guy that had called 911. So we get out and there's a woman lying on the sidewalk and you can tell right away that she had some pretty critical wounds. Initially, I thought it was a gunshot because it came out as a basic life support call, which means we only get dispatched with one ambulance. Okay. I think it came out as uh, subject down or something. I forget what it was. It was no mention of knife or anything. Cause I don't think anybody knew. So it didn't seem dire from the call. It didn't seem dire at all. So you get out and you know, you do quick scene. I see a guy standing about 15, 20 feet away. Me and my partner get out and we look and we, we notice, oh my, man, this, this, this woman's not doing good. She's got just at first glance, we didn't know, like I said, gunshot or knife. Um, so we start administering aid to her and we realize quickly that, that she's got multiple knife wounds, uh, in critical places of her body. And this woman is, she needs surgical intervention. There's not much we can do here. Um, she needs to get to a trauma center and they need to administer surgical intervention. So I, I looked to my right and that guy's still there. And, you know, I, I said, Hey, do you know anything about this? Um, uh, did you see anything? What happened? And, uh, at that moment I looked up and, and he had blood on his pants and things started kind of coming into clear focus in my mind. And he stepped to the left 
And from out behind his pant leg, he had a knife. He had a, uh, I think it was an eight inch chef's knife in his hand. And at that point, uh, you know, I jump up, uh, you know, I'm telling him, drop the knife, drop the knife. I'm telling my partner, uh, my partner, uh, amazing act of valor, never stopped his uh, aid on the woman at the time. He even had the guy, uh, his back to the guy, which, uh, I mean, he, he was more focused on that. So at that time, the rest of the cavalry arrived, the engine arrived, uh, they called police immediately. Um, the, the guy ended up being subdued after a brief foot chase by, by, by the police. But, you know, you see, you see the, you see the guns getting pulled. And literally at that point, my partner and I were running for cover because this guy was kind of moving toward us and this, the line of fire with the cops. And so it's, uh, it almost plays out in slow motion. Everything's happening. You're trying to take it all in. You're ducking behind cars and it really doesn't seem like reality. You don't, you think, oh, I'm ducking behind a car because the police could shoot and I can get shot. But it, I think at that time your body goes into fight or flight and you're not thinking about that stuff. But, uh, yeah, that eight inch chef's knife, I mean, even though she was that close to the hospital, a, it wasn't a trauma hospital. So they weren't trained to deal with that. Um, I mean, they are trained to deal with that. And luckily it happened in the middle of the day. So they probably had the staff on, um, but it's not something they see on a regular basis. So the middle of the day, I, that whole story, I saw it in the night in a dark alley, but it was yeah. happening in the bright light of day. Middle of the day happened, uh, right in front of a, uh, a county, a county building. Yeah. So right was, behind the hospital. So was this guy agitated? What was his state? He was, uh, he was very calm. He was very calm. Like I said, he kind of stood, stood there. I mean, at, at any point he could have rushed us with that knife, but he was just kind of standing there hiding the knife. You know, I didn't even see it behind his pant leg until he, he pulled it out. So, uh, but, but she was a very small woman. She was probably 90 pounds, 95 pounds, Jeez. very, very skinny. Um, so you could imagine what an eight inch chef's knife would do. Yeah. the damage it would inflict uh, going through somebody's body that that small. Well, according to FBI crime statistics, most knife attacks happen with simple kitchen knives. You know, we absolutely <clears throat> spend all this money on these fancy knives uh, and, and uh, walk around with sometimes getting sideways glances with that clip showing. But really, this is just a little thing to pull out to, to cut the thread off of my collar. You yes, know? exactly. When, when people have bad intent, they usually grab the closest thing to them, and it's almost never a, a Hinderer XM24. You know, it's a it's a kitchen knife. You're right. So have you ever seen something um, that has happened like that 8-inch chef's knife that's like the psycho knife? It's it's like a sword. It is. You know? Yeah. Have you ever seen anything like pocket knife, any any sort of uh, any sort of occurrence? You, you told me once about a, a kid who, who killed his dad. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he did... Uh... You know, I don't know, uh, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what knife was used on that one, but the wounds were obviously, uh, you know, they were, they were horrific. That was one of the, probably one of the worst calls I'd ever, I'd ever been on to see that type of rage and anger toward a uh, family member. It, um, it, it does. I, I think I, I think I mentioned it. it makes you question humanity and, uh, and, and where it's gone at times. You see the best of both worlds in a job. You see the worst and you, and then sometimes you see, you see the best, you know, you see babies being born, you see, uh, you know, uh, husband and wife welcoming their baby into this world. And this is a whole new chapter for them. Uh, you know, you definitely see good in people, um, but you also see the worst. So, you know, just to pull it out of that basement for a minute, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> I once got you a, uh, I, I want to talk about the, a, a piece of equipment. Oh, okay. You remember the Leatherman Raptor? Yes. Matter right. of fact, I do. I got you that, I think, because you had commented on how cool it was. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, the Leatherman Raptor is a, um, it's a tool for first responders made by Leatherman. And it's like a folding pair of scissors, those kind of scissors that you get under, uh, get under bandages with, yeah. but it has a bunch of other applications to it. Did you, did you ever use that on the job? Was that a handy tool? Or? It does. Uh, I did for a little while. Oh. I tried to carry it, uh, the holster on it. Uh, you know, it comes with a, uh, it's not a Kydex holster. I can tell you that it's a, I think it's just a, a mold, a plastic mold, mm -hmm. uh, that it clips into. Um, I think that I'm not a guy that I don't like to have a bat belt when I'm on duty, <laughs> you know, that's what I'll call them. You know, you see these guys that have every tool known to man on their, on their person. And hey, you know what? If that works for that person, that's cool. That just doesn't work for me. So you're willing to run to the truck to get whatever you Well, need. most of the time, 
whenever we're on the call, we have trauma shears, uh, which is basically what those are, um, you know, trauma shears on steroids. <laughs> you know, they have a window punch. They have, uh, I think they have a knife. They have a seatbelt cutter. Uh, there's even a, I think there's a little small ruler on there. And that's, that, that's handy. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You can. Let's see. He's got a four inch wound. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, it, yes, yes. And I, and I'm sure that is exactly why, uh, that was made that way. And that ruler was put in there because it is, you can do a quick measurement of a wound. And those are things that are handy. You know, absolutely. When you're calling into a trauma hospital and you have a trauma, if, if it's multiple stab wounds, you're not going to take the time to measure each one and say, you know, I have this many. It's like this, this person stabbed up. All right. They got 25 entry wounds. Uh, you know, but I think, I think the intent is good. Uh, it just didn't, it didn't really work for me. Uh, I found them to be just a little bit uh, of a hindrance as far as having to unfold them mm-hmm. every time mm-hmm. I wanted to use them. I think they can go in the hole. I'm not sure if they can go in the holster if they're fully expanded. Yeah, they can. I, I remember that being a feature, but, but I could see how, you know, the simple tool is the scissor and you use it a lot. Yeah. I would imagine. And so to have to unfold it and then also have a, all these other tools in the way as you're using it, I could see that being, uh, you know, Maybe that tool is better to just leave in the in the truck for an emergency because you have so many tools yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. So now you're shifting gears and training recruits in the recruit academy. Yeah. Or not the training academy. Training academy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you have a bunch of fresh faces coming through. Maybe maybe some that are not so fresh, but most of them you've you've told me somewhat about the, about your class. Most of them have not been involved in military activity or first responder activity before joining the fire department. So I would imagine you have to, um, as you're training their bodies up and their skills up for fighting fires and, and that kind of thing, you also have to prepare them mentally for the kind of things they are going to see. Yeah. What what does that look like? What kind of preparation do you give them for the psychological aspect of the job? We're paramilitaristic, I would say. Paramilitaristic light. Uh, I, I'm having never gone through basic training for uh, the armed forces, I couldn't tell you, uh, my only experiences from friends of mine that have been through basic training. And we try and emulate that to a, a point. It's th- that, that's an interesting question because I, I've pondered that myself. How do you get somebody ready to go into a profession that is traumatic on your body, traumatic on your mind? It's a constant possible. This could be the last call in my life. So we, we, we stress them out and we tell them we're going to. We tell them we're going to put you in the, in the, in the situations where you're physically tired, you're mentally tired, you're completely stressed out. I want, I want to know where your breaking point is. I don't want to know what happens to you when you get to that breaking point. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's constantly an experiment to, because you're really trying to figure out what each person's trigger is and, and, and push them to that point because you don't want them to buckle you. Like I said, you want them to be the calmest person in the room. They've got to be able to revert back to their training and to the basics that they've learned throughout the 28 weeks of academy to be able to survive in the job. Really, uh, there's so many instances of what we call high risk, uh, low frequency events. And those are obviously they're, they're very high risk. There are a lot of danger involved in them. Uh, but they, they happen so rarely that your skills may not be up to, up to snap when you, when it's that time to go. Uh, so you want to train on those, on those type things, you know, large area search. We'll just put it like that. Say, um, sofa store, a furniture store went on fire, uh, and you had to go in and search, uh, for possible victims. So you go into this large warehouse. When we teach them to search, we teach them a, a left, right handed search where you get on the right hand, uh, of the wall and you just kind of go around the room and you, you figure it out. Now I'm asking you to go into a multi thousand square foot warehouse on a line and you have to search off of a tagline. You're looking probably in low visibility. Those are, those are very, very low frequency, but the risk that comes with it is immense. So, so does training for that kind of extreme situation give you a general calm that's so that when you show up to that call where a kid has killed his dad because he's raging, does that uh, calm that you may have gained from going into that smoky warehouse, does that filter down into the smaller, more personal, um, experiences like these grisly scenes you've been on? Um, you know, I, I've never been in a smoky warehouse. I've only, I've only trained on it, you know? It, right. But it, does that training, which is seems so frightening and so, you know, 
life threatening. Yeah. Does that add to the to your general sense of composure when you see something horrible? Uh, it probably has some type of factor in it. Um, you know, and tr- trust me, I'm 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 not one to uh, stand here as uh, the most composed guy <laughs> on those calls. You know, I, I definitely have moments where excitement gets the best of me, and hopefully, I've realized it in time. But I, I think I think now that uh, you know, now that I'm uh, I'm an officer, it allows you to kind of step back and take a look at the bigger picture. You're not so focused whereas uh at the time with that scene that you that you keep referencing uh and uh keep bringing me back to that place bob sorry man. Uh, but at, at that time i'm focused on the guy and i'm focused on his wounds whereas being an officer you're focused you're focused more on the on the, the entire big picture is the guy still on the scene those were our first reports you know so you add to that you had police showing up taking out assault rifles uh flanking you while you're trying to care to this guy so you've got all this other stuff going on and you're like oh man am i gonna get shot during this too that's just another uh, you know a- another aspect of that so you know it's it's hard you try to maintain the wider vision without you know you want to stay out of the tunnel vision that's the uh i think that's the big the big thing that's probably good advice for pretty much anything yeah yeah keep your focus open until it has to close on something specific absolutely Tell me something that uh, our listeners who are constantly around these dangerous tools, playing with them, or like in my shop, using <laughs> angle grinders and such. Tell us again what we should have around and what kind of, you know, if there if there are any kind of videos we can watch that might um, that might help us give us an idea. Well, let me let me put it this way: you sent me that video of that Russian guy uh, mountain biking, he was mountain biking, and he yeah. was impaled on his own handlebars, and he yeah. had the wherewithal to. Well, what did he do? He yeah, he knew he, uh, they, he, he crashed. I think they were professional mountain bikers. He crashed and his handlebar went into his femoral artery, right into his groin and it punctured it. And you can see his buddy's got a GoPro on and this guy had the wherewithal, the calmness to direct him. And he knew how life threatening this was. He knew that if he didn't get pressure on it and stop the bleeding, he was going to die right up, right there on that, on that trail. So. I would say it never hurts to go out and take a, a general first aid course. You know, yeah. uh, if you don't know that stuff, go out and take a first aid course. No CPR. And if, and if you want to build a little home kit, if you're, if you, if you like knives, if you're a knife enthusiast and uh, you know, get yourself a tourniquet, you can buy any, any kind of tourniquet, uh, right? Amazon sells anything or whatever site you want to use. A good tourniquet, uh, preferably a, a military tourniquet that's been proven. Uh, there are better ones. Uh, the Israelis so, have good ones, don't they? I mean, we, we have the we have the Israeli bandage. That's just that's a form of a pressure dressing. Uh, so get, get yourself a pressure dressing, um, some some gauze. You know, have those kits ready. And like I said, know how to use them. Know know how practice with them one handed. You know, like I, like we always do. You practice with them in the worst situations. That way, when it's perfect situations, you'll 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 be a master at it. So you want to be able to do it one handed. And it's not really that hard. Um, those, those tourniquets are pretty self-explanatory, but, but no, like it really takes a lot of force to stop the blood, uh, from, from somebody that's, uh, from somebody that's bleeding out, especially with that, that video of that guy, yeah. he told his buddy, Hey, put your knee in, in, into my groin. And yeah. that's one of the techniques that we, we practice. And he told them to put more, more pressure. More Absolutely. Pressure. Was- you, you, you literally, you can't have enough pressure. I mean, it, it has to physically put that person in agony. That's about how much pressure you have to, to put on to close that artery to stop that bleeding. And you only got three minutes to do it. So <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure. No pun intended. <laughs> Kurt, it's been great having you on the on the podcast. Thank you for uh, opening up. I know these things aren't so easy to talk about, you know, to to uh, rehash some memories uh, that may not be so pleasant, but have informed you, made you a smarter person, and can help inform us. So I am going to get a tourniquet, and I'm going to get uh, more quick clot. I know I have yeah. that around, but it turns to dust after a while. I wanted, I wanted you noticed the quote I had up in my kitchen that said. Life is too short to carry an ugly knife and too ugly to carry a short knife. Yes. Well, that is a quote from Matt Freeman, also known as CMFTW, Continue Mission F the World. He was a, a former uh, infantryman and uh, saw some really, really hard times after he came back. He started knife making, became a big personality in the knife world and on YouTube. And 
I admired him very much and he just passed away. I, may he rest in peace. I feel very bad about that. I wanted to talk to him on this show, as a matter of fact. Um, but he always showed his blowout kit. He walked around, uh, well, he was a different guy, you yeah. know, than most. He walked around with a big Bowie knife on his, on his leg because it's legal and he could. And he also carried a blowout kit on his, on his left, uh, hip. And in one of his videos, he showed he opened it up and he had all, he had a tourniquet. He had quick clot. I mean, he's a former infantryman. He knew what to carry, but yeah. I always kind of thought, uh, isn't that going a little bit too far? But now that we're talking about it, this man also carried, you know, two knives on of them, one being a large Bowie knife. So, I mean, Anything can happen. He also practiced uh, Pekiti Tersha Kali like I do. So, he, okay. you know, he could easily be messing around with that, go absent minded for a second and stab himself. He kept that on himself uh, at all times. And I think it's a it's a good lesson to learn. You might not have to keep it on your person, but keep it in your bag. Keep it in your man purse. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Have it ready. Have it ready. And uh, more importantly, know how to use it properly. That's the that's the big thing. That is the big thing. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a show. <laughs> well, then maybe you can show me. Maybe we can do a video in the in the future. Sure, and you can show me how to yeah. show us all how to do some of that stuff. Kurt, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.